I didn't understand what was happening, but I am in a very unsightly state right now. An acute pain that makes me feel paralyzed is spreading everywhere in my body. I try to calmly recollect what happened before. There was an explosion, yes, something fell from the sky, smashing through the damn abandoned building I was in. A series of bombs were launched, and they landed very close to me. Something on my back feels wet, probably some blood. I slowly raised my head with a lot of difficulty. It feels like my innards are burning, perhaps because they are falling out through the laceration in my chest. Oh, now I feel my conscience slowly slipping away. What a shame. Why should I die now when I am least expecting it? Just when my life started to go uphill? It feels as if the devil himself came here to toy with my life. As my consciousness was slowly dying, I caught some movement nearby. Something warm, salty, with a taste of iron, began to pour on my face and lips, blood. I tried to concentrate and at least open my eyes, but there was no strength left in my body. Leave him. Someone said in a faint-sounding voice, as if he was a bit distant from me, don't waste your energy. This is my own business, do not interfere, another voice, calmly replied. A little closer, but just as faint and distant sounding. Listen, you are not God, you can't save everyone. At least this one. A sharp pain, several orders of magnitude more potent than the previous one, twisted my body, causing convulsions and spasms all at the same time. The sheer intensity of the pain made me feel that I should have lost consciousness or died altogether. But no, I'm still alive. It is useless. You will die like that, through the pain, I heard voices that drifted farther and farther away. Together, with the pain. You idiot. If you die so stupidly, I'll take a shit on your grave. No. I won't even bury you. You're right. There were notes of guilt in the second voice. With this phrase, the last anchor seemed to let me go, the pain went away, and my consciousness finally sank into darkness. Oh, for God's sake, the old grandfather, who was in front of me, was indignant. Looking around, I realized that I was standing in the middle of some sort of high-end office. There were white walls with a white table and white chairs. The iron filing cabinets that stretched on and on as if they go to infinity were also white. Sorry? Forgiven, the old man screamed angrily, closing the folder with papers and throwing it behind. Contrary to my expectations, the folder did not just fly and hit the wall, but smoothly glided into an open cabinet drawer in the distance. This place is a connector between all the worlds. Not some part. What are you talking about, sir? Sir? What a surprise. The old man threw up his hands. For once to be respected. As I should be. The old man leaned against the table holding out his hand in front of him and wagging his finger at me. I'm so tired of you all. I have lived here for millions of years, working, and you people have been drawn here, like shit to flies. Flies to shit. Do not interrupt, the old man screamed while slapped his palm on the table. If I say that it's shit to flies, then it is shit to flies. The old man thought for a moment, but quickly regained his displeased look. In short, s. Ah, I already said that. Anyway, in short. You are dead, you have not lost your memory, your soul has not been cleaned, and I hate you for that. You spoil my whole work. And statistics. Can you imagine? Moreover, I also have to give you something. Where is the universe heading? Sigh. Um. Don't um to me here. So what have we got here? The old man moved his hand over the table, and a small folder of documents appeared in front of him. He flipped through it with incredible speed and closed it. Well, they have finally finished developing there, the old man whistled delightedly. Who? Huh? Never mind. What should I slip you? Brains? Brains? You must have your own. Oh, let me implant this guy's blood in you. Blood? I don't need you to inject any blood from any guy. My own is enough. Oh, don't worry, it's figurative. Yes. I will inject the positive parts, remove the negative part. An imperfect. 
A multi-layered sphere appeared on the table in front of the old man in the form of a projection, with so many layers of complex lines it made my head a bit dizzy. If you look closely, it consisted of many tiny symbols. They glowed, each with their own color, but something was red, that something looked like it didn't fit in. With such speed that his hand movements became blurred, the old man began to make changes around the sphere. The red something gradually became more and more naturally blended into the general multicolored structure, thereby constantly assuming a more natural color. After some time, the old man finished his witchcraft, causing the sphere to disappear. They bothered me with their appearance on the whole branch of world's thing. But, the old man pointed an edifying finger at the ceiling. If you people can't stop appearing here, then I will personally throw you to some random world. He opened the folder, waved his hand, which showed a round seal, and with quick movements, he put a series of symbols on the sheets. Everything disappeared with the last symbol, the table, the walls, the office, and I was once again plunged into darkness. I woke up in bed. I had no doubts that this was a toddler's cradle. There were even railings here, or whatever the thing by the side of the bed for toddlers is called. My head was spinning, it was like waking up with a horrible hangover, but it went away, pretty quickly. At least to some extent. My mind was in a mess. Random scraps of someone else's memory were flowing into my brain. However, I was able to isolate the most important things. Just a few phrases and images made me quickly understand that I was reborn and where. We all know this tale. There will be no squib in this family. Don't you dare touch my son. Exile by the ritual, and you, Narcissa, know your place. Not a drop of Malfoy blood will remain in this dirty squib. There were more conservations happening between them, but the argument was the same with no change in the result. I now understand why I do not remember anything. An infant's long-term memory leaves much to be desired. It is almost impossible to remember something at this age. Because of this, it seems like my life began now, and not long ago. I remembered these phrases, because I was emotionally hurt, and I was outraged. The adult consciousness I had now made it possible for me to understand English correctly. Still, I did not completely remember what was happening around me, continuously forgetting what was happening half an hour or an hour ago, is an unpleasant sensation. Lucius is a real asshole. I do not like to swear, but ordinary words cannot even begin to describe how I feel about him. Narcissa turned out to be a stunning blonde, and those couple of memories with her were perfect. She looked at me with tenderness and motherly love. There is also my brother, Draco. Narcissa wanted to name me according to the traditions of her family. Still, the dispute on this topic with Lucius did not have time to end. I don't know what it was, but somehow, they thought I was a squib. Well, that makes everything clear. I vaguely remember being thrown at the door of the first house of ordinary people that we came across. They found me only in the morning. Makes me feel as if I am some sort of alternate Harry Potter. Well, anyway, this is where I live now. Maximilian Knight, which is spelled as Knight. At least that's what it says on the envelopes with receipts for payment, which were sorted out by the people who sheltered me. Yesterday, it seemed. Nursed and sorted out. Well, I was peeping. And now what can I do? So, I'm a squib, that is kind of disheartening. I do not believe that the wizards that the Malfoy couple can afford will make mistakes in diagnostics. Well, or how did they define it all there? So, I had better not meddle in the magical world and make my way here. It's a shame, but that old man said something. And how can you find out so early exactly? It is also not clear. So, we will just grow, remember the old, learn the new. Life was measured and fast. The adult mind tends to perceive time somewhat differently. For a child, time flows slowly only because his every day is full of new discoveries, impressions, and memories. I did not see anything new, nothing surprising. Everything has already been done before. It has already become a routine. In the first years of living with the Knights couple, the nicest people I have ever seen, I still waited and hoped. Waited for some underage magic. But nothing changed. 
I tried meditation and whatever I could think of. But in the end, I only fell asleep a bit later than usual. The Knights Couple Sarah and John Bland names, if I have to be honest, but I could not boast of having an exclusive name in the past, and you know what, I lived very well until I died. They have children of their own, but they have already grown up and successfully built their careers out in the city. I think that's one of the reasons why the Knights did not mind raising another child at all. John, an ordinary-looking guy, a lawyer at some firm, quite successful. Average height, ordinary face, light brown hair, brown eyes, a typical John. He earns a lot and spends everything, mainly on the house, his wife, and me. Sarah is a young-looking slim woman even though she is in her forties, a brunette with brown eyes. At first glance, her appearance is not above average, but the way she holds herself, the way she smiles, laughs, moves, in general, makes people like her and have a good impression of her. Time slowly passes, and now I am nine years old. I am an ALA student in a decent school, I devote myself to athletics. Well, to whatever extent is it possible at this age. I go to a kendo club, which was very hard to find in the local community. I play the violin and piano. I remember. I remember very well how I regretted these missed opportunities in my past life. I didn't want it. It's hard. I don't like it, I don't need it at all. And the adults said that I would regret it, but I was a child, then a teenager, youthful maximalism in all its glory. Now I'll catch up, and then I will regret something else. We lived in a small, but spacious private house in the suburbs of London. There is everything you need a large shopping center, parks, schools, private kindergartens. In general, nothing new for me, I once lived in England for six years. I had tried to go to Cambridge or Oxford, but I had no money. I was smart. I had the intelligence required to excel in science, the desire to learn more, and there were irrepressible ambitions, and a hole in my pocket. Right, I was somewhat socially unadapted. It was the reluctance of the brain to work in a social direction that let poor me down. To put it simply, in my past life, I wasted a lot of time. I smelled the aromas of the bottom, stayed in the middle class, and was quite rich for a while, but instantly fucked everything up. I thought that I would always have time to earn more. Hmm, ow, I retrated that thought later. The life of the nights is quite good, and I learned a lot of new things. The truth is that the things I learned were mainly understanding how real English gentlemen should hold themselves and behave. The knights were not very picky and did not demand me to always act like a real Englishman. Still, it was necessary to know everything and be able to do them. I am happy in a past life, my self-development was always lacking. The sudden squeal of tires jerked me out of my thoughts. A truck was rushing towards me with astonishing speed. Then from within my body, a sharp feeling, as if electricity hit, was running through me an instant rush of adrenaline. It seemed that even time has slowed down. The right transmigrator must have several things, superpower, a killer truck, a personal antagonist, and a lifelong goal in any order. It was these thoughts that rushed through my head. An irresistible desire to wave my hand, as if driving away from an annoying fly, forced me to make this wave. Red liquid burst out of the ground and, in the form of three stripes, stretched out after the hand's movement, forming a kind of hemisphere in front of me. Simultaneously, the truck at full speed crashed into it as if it was a concrete wall. I saw how the truck's front was deformed, the headlights burst out, glass fragments flew, how it clamped down on the fat driver, flattening him. I saw how the streams of blood squeezed out of him, pouring into the red streaks in front of me. Suddenly my speed of perception returned to normal. I was deafened by the sound of the impact and the grinding of the truck's frame, light clouds of dust. I stood in the middle of a hemisphere of twisted metal. Gasoline smell, smoke, and oil were everywhere. There was no trace of the red, bloody barrier. I need to get out of here. It was a rather dark and empty alley, so I just ran around the corner of the house, twisted a little more, and walked steadily on. My heart was beating like crazy. Blood was pounding in my temples. I walked down the street and stared blankly at my hands. So suddenly, a man died today because of me. 
but if I hadn't defended myself, I would have been dead myself. The beginning of a new, incredible journey, finished sorting my own thoughts. This is indeed so, and the sudden realization softened the rolling flurry of emotions. I need to go home. After all, I'm somewhat of a wizard. After that incident with the truck, I began to actively dig into myself. The first thing that came to mind was to awaken the sensations, which allowed me to create the blood shield. Without blood, but from the blood. Paradox. Now it was summer, so I went for a walk in the morning with a clear conscience, came for lunch, left again. The knights were not surprised. They even whispered in the kitchen that maybe I'd finally found some friends. However, I was just hanging out in an overgrown part of the park that was nearby. Although this area was well hidden from the people, while there were never any gatherings of gangs, drug addicts, drunks, or young people. The reason for this is simple, the police station across the street. Well, the suburb I live in is pretty calm anyway. Here, I just sat on a bench in the middle of the bushes and tried to awaken that magic, or whatever it was. It is difficult to describe as I do not really understand what that was. Still, after that case, I have always felt something new in myself, but I did not understand how to get through to it. It was only on the fifth day that I finally managed to connect with it. Like on the four days before, I just sat and focused on the strange feeling, picking up mental images, commands, something to get through. I'm not sure if the right key had come up or if someone took pity on me finally allowing me to access it. There were no special effects, thunder, lightning, flashes of light, or even heat in the chest. Just on my outstretched palm, from out of nowhere, a tiny red ball appeared, which grew to the size of a tennis ball very quickly. Crimson red. The color of blood. And the material of the ball, the liquid, spoke for themselves. Well, I'm not just some lord of tomato juice in the end although I shouldn't deny it right away. I started experimenting with the ball hovering over the palm of my hand, trying to change its shape, size. It turned out, frankly, very bad. It required an intense concentration, and it pleased me that the ball appeared out of nowhere and not pumped out from within my body. I finished my unsuccessful experiments only when I felt exhausted. It was necessary to stop concentrating on the ball, as it just disappeared after that. I got up, did some stretches, the body seems ready for battle, but I felt fatigue. In my brain? Interesting. All summer, I continued my experiments, immersing myself in a new discovery about myself. Blood manipulation, I tested for taste. So here we are. Manipulations every day were more comfortable and easier for me. The ball gradually grew in size based on my will. Of course, not without difficulty, I learned to turn it into needles, blades, different geometric shapes. Yes, I do not have a rich imagination, but to implement some thoughts, based on the fact that it is blood, I was frankly afraid. To interfere in the circulatory system in your body while having no knowledge, experience, or control is equivalent to suicide. While I could use it on someone else, I'm not that cruel. I'm not that black-hearted. At least not until I have the knowledge and the power and control to return everything to the way it was. The knowing that I possess magic didn't give me any rest either, but no matter how much I focused on making it something else, it turned out only as blood. In addition to blood's magic, I noticed another interesting point, I became a little more resilient and stronger. I started to engage in physical training more rigorously, to make an athletic body, but if my standard physical characteristics continue to increase, then training the body to grow and develop as I want will become somewhat problematic. Autumn came, I had to go to school, and the amount of free time I had for training dropped dramatically. I still continued to go to the kendo and study music, diligently learning. Yes, I had to learn. I have the knowledge, but repetition is the mother of learning. I am not a genius, after all. Therefore, I approached with all diligence I could muster, albeit mostly the simplest things, but sometimes indulging in more complex material in the school library and at home. In the kendo classes, I found out that I had accelerated regeneration. 
Although it would be more correct to say that it was detected afterward, rare abrasions and frequent bruises healed much faster. But there was a negative side. If earlier I would give it my best and be slightly above average, now I am faster and stronger than my peers, and training no longer brings the same results. The same is true for athletics. There is no progress. Closer to the new year, old habit, for Christmas, something incredible happened. A standard underage magic event took place, not a bloodbath. I was sent to clean the roof of the garage after a recent snowfall. It was necessary to install a couple of Christmas decorations. That's where I slipped, standing on the edge. I wouldn't have anything to do, there's a snowdrift down there, there's land under it. But that's not what I was thinking about at the time of the fall. And oh, it was a miracle. I suddenly hovered over the ground. I started to get up, there was still a small hurricane underneath me, throwing snowflakes. It's like I had a jet exhaust in one place. There was a strangely warm feeling in my chest until I landed. Slowly and carefully. I stood and looked at my feet with a silly smile on my face. Long live new possibilities. I cried out, unable to hold back, with my fist to the sky. Max. Have you cleared the snow? The voice of my adoptive father sounded from around the corner of the house. No. New opportunities. I'm a wizard, not just a lord of tomato juice. It was challenging to master the new magical possibilities. It's about as hard as it is if they weren't there. Month. It took a month to make a torn piece of notebook hover over the table. I've already lost faith in myself, to be honest. I thought it was another hemomancy screwdriver, but no. That was magic. Then it became much easier, the first conscious success was significant. But even more important was faith. Without faith in what is desired, it is almost impossible to get it. But with confidence. I've done a lot of things, but on a tiny scale. I set fire, levitated, created water, controlled it, turned matches into needles on the bare will created small balls of light, not larger than a firefly. I had as much fun as I could. The relationship with the foster parents was smooth. They were glad that the child was growing independent and purposeful, developing versatility. It seems they did not notice any strangeness. But, on the other hand, I do this, not for a fight, but to make up for what I would like to do then, in a past life. As time went on, I persevered and waited for my eleventh birthday, counting on a letter from Hogwarts. I don't even know what I'm going to do, or if I should do anything when it comes. I'm a Malfoy, after all. Wait. According to Lucius, and if he did the ritual, I'm not a Malfoy, but then there's Black. What's on the calendar? Fourth of June. I'm eleven tomorrow. Black, yes. That's bad. I once read all sorts of fanfiction in a previous life. I hope there is no lineage magic. It's a lot of trouble, because if there will be lineage magic. Thanks to the ritual of Lucius, I'm pure blood black. Based on this, if the events here are as in the original story, only Sirius is alive, who is unlikely to be in his own mind by his release time. And even if he will, his description in the story clearly speaks of the reluctance to inherit lineage. Then I remain. Guy, pure black. Wizard. And that means a bunch, a massive bunch of problems. Next question, whether to get caught the I Malfoys? For a long time, I did not remember my origin and the hostile act of Lucius. Also, know your place, Narcissa still makes me want to be extremely cruel to this man. Narcissa remained a beautiful blonde with a sweet and gentle smile in my memories, holding me in her arms. Sentimentality, yes, I know, but I can't do it any other way. But what if she loves him that way? Who knows? I stand in front of the mirror and grin at my reflection, short, thick, straight hair, the same blonde as Narcissa's. Blue eyes, a smooth face without the slightest flaw, even too perfect, some kind of girlish, and there is no longer a childish roundness. God, I'm the man's copy of Narcissa. And these little sharp, predatory features. But in me, 
only the blind does not recognize her. Strangely, I haven't noticed much before. I have a high height for my age and an incredible physique. Well, no wonder. I worked hard after all. I was learning control over hemomancy. Thank God, I learned how to disable the passive amplification of the body, so I called it. This way, I trained as before, but I had to continually focus on my weakening. An absurd situation, but even with the amplification turned on, the effect from it increased proportionally. In a great mood, I went for a walk. Evening, good weather, why not? Walking around the suburbs in a dormitory format is boring, but the air here is noticeably cleaner than in London. You can walk in the park, buy ice cream, look at people. It seems like I'm getting old. Well, that is, where have you seen this? A young boy with a critical look walks around the city, enjoying the silence, peace, birds in the park. Nonsense. I like this. In a past life, I smoked hard, which killed my subtle sense of smell entirely. Now, there are so many smells as then, long ago in childhood, in a past life. I remember the scent of blooming lilacs, apple trees, the smell of rain, ozone, wet asphalt. Subtle notes from a stinky Christmas tree in a passing car. And now I'm just glad to have the fullness of sensations. But then I did not even understand how much I had lost, having acquired chronic bronchitis instead of addiction. I went back for the second lap, to the park, not far from home. Almost no people left around only at the entrance, I noticed a young couple hugging, leaving this place. Sudden chest pain almost made me twist, but I overcame it and immediately rushed to the side, not taking apart the road. It hurt so much that my eyes were cloudy, everything was blurring, but it was from speed. I'm faster than a human being. Much faster. I can't stop. There was a lot of heat, but the slower I moved, the worse I got. So I was doing the only thing that could relieve the pain and the heat, moving. The raging pulse beat the ears, stunned. I don't know where I ended up, but there were bushes and trees around, and not a single familiar and inherent light source to the city. The pain twisted me completely. I think I was screaming, sticking my fingers into the ground. Fuck. The old man's voice from the white cabinet rang out. Why you bring only problems? Drag everything with you, break the space of the entrusted area. After these words in me, as if something had burst, exploded, releasing pain into the whole body, and further, beyond its limits. My eyes opened, and I was literally put on my knees. Hurricane from bloody ribbons around shredded the ground, bushes, trees, smashing everything into dust and slivers. I felt my hair stand on end. At the edge of my eye, I saw a tiny dot of light rushing from the sky to me, approaching very quickly. I blinked, and it had already grown to the size of a basketball and hovered in front of me at arm's length. Through pain, I tried to understand what it was. Fool. The old man's voice rang out again. Take it with your hands. Keeping the portals between worlds here is not my job. Why are you helping then? Grumpy old man. Because this crap will still creep through, but it will tear space. The answer was unexpected, but I did not dare to argue with this old man, wherever he was now. Overcoming the pain in my body, I stretched out my hand to the luminous sphere and wanted to take it, but my hand sank into it as if there was nothing there. Suddenly the sphere began to change. Transparent crystals appeared from the air, slowly folding into some form. This did not last long, and soon in my hands was a rather fanciful bastard sword with a carved black hilt and guard and a black blade. The handle and guard were decorated with gold floral motifs. As soon as the sword finally materialized in my hands, the pain passed, and the bloody hurricane subsided, absorbed in the blade. The sword immediately grew on the hands of a bloody film, instantly disappearing in the body. That's it. Don't even dream that I'll help a second time. Fuck. Only problems. The old man's voice in my head seemed to be moving away. What the hell was that? I asked aloud when the forces began to come back to me, and the feeling of phantom pain began to disappear. The answer came from where I did not expect information from my own head. That was a spiritual weapon. That's all. 
nothing else is clear. Such a flash of magic, or whatever it was, could not go unnoticed, and I had no doubt about it. There was a series of claps next to me, people were bustling, but I felt terrible. Hands up, everyone, shouted some guy. Wars are working. Quiet, a woman hissed at him. Don't you see, the child had uncontrollable underage magic. I wish I had such underage magic in childhood. They were talking about something else. The woman waved her magic wand in front of me, checked my health, it seems. What to do next? I would like to go home, I said. Oh, the boy is strong, the man grinned. No matter how I tried to see who was talking, the floating vision and darkness did not relate to this. We have no right, the woman said with displeasure. Silly rules. With that, she thrust a small bottle into my hands. Drink. It will help. In a couple of minutes, you will come to your senses and go home. Well, at least not a single living soul is nearby. Otherwise, I would have to call Obliviators again. What to do with the boy? I'll find out now. What is your name? Max Knight. I can't see, but it looks like the woman nodded and stepped aside. After a couple of seconds, the eyes were touched by a light flash and she left. And a minute later, she reappeared. Nothing, the woman said. He'll find out tomorrow. Haven't you had a drink yet? I'm feeling better, my health really improved pretty quickly, and I was even able to get up, swaying a little. I gave the bottle back. I don't think it's a good idea to drink something out of the hands of a stranger. Ha! Huh. Constant vigilance. The man smiled, and I was finally able to see him. Not a man, but a young guy, twenty-five years old. Ordinary appearance, and in the red robe. Don't start, the girl rolled her eyes. Also, nothing unusual, and the age is about the same. And you, young man. Max. Max. You'll find out tomorrow without us. Can you get home? Yes, I said. Even if I wanted to ask questions, I wouldn't have the strength to do so. The oars waved and disappeared into the apparitions, it seems to be so called. And I. I leisurely walked home. Birthday morning came quickly and suddenly. It would seem yesterday I just closed my eyes in bed, blinked, and now it's time to get up. As always, I did my exercises, washed my face, and went down to breakfast. He had just greeted the knights when the doorbell rang. And who was impatient to visit our home early in the morning? The foster father was indignant, getting up from the table and going to open the door. A minute later, he entered the dining room, accompanied by a lady in her early fifties. Tall and stately, in a black dress and green robe, she looked at Sarah and me with a stern look. Good morning. I am Minerva McGonagall. I am the deputy headmistress of Hogwarts, and I am authorized to convey to Mr. Maximilian Knight an invitation to study at the School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, she said in a dry voice, taking a yellowish envelope from the sleeve of her robe and handing it to me. Hello, nice to meet you, we greeted, and I took the letter. Have a seat. Father hesitated. Just a professor, McGonagall said, and sat down at the proposed seat. I, in turn, opened the envelope and found there a letter on yellow parchment, the most common invitation to study at Hogwarts, and a list of necessary things. I see you're not particularly surprised, McGonagall said, and it was only now that I noticed that the knights weren't really surprised. That would explain some of the weirdness that was happening to Max, John said calmly, and Sarah just nodded. I see. What is required from me, and where to buy all this? McGonagall told me that accompanying me for shopping was her second purpose of visiting us. I was sent to pack. At the same time, the knights discussed financial matters with the professor. I got dressed in my black business suit. Knights are somewhat conservative, so having at least a few suits in your wardrobe is a must. I also put on a black shirt. I just want it, and that's it. I went downstairs, wholly ready to travel and McGonagall was already waiting for me on the doorstep. The father handed over a small bundle of money for exchange and ordered to buy the highest quality, functional, and necessary. Take my hand, Mr. Knight, McGonagall told me, and I followed the directions. Get ready. It's pretty frustrating the first time. 
It was as if I was twisted into minced meat and pulled forward by the navel. One moment, and I'm already standing on the sidewalk in London, holding the professor's hand. I was nauseous, but compared to yesterday's adventure, this is just annoying trouble. The professor praised my restraint and headed for the door of the nearest establishment, the sign of which read, The Leaky Cauldron. I followed her and found myself in a gloomy Gothic tavern with a not very pleasant contingent. People here looked like they were homeless. Just a little bit. We silently walked through the leaky cauldron hall and out into the backyard of the establishment. The professor took her wand out of her sleeve and touched it to the bricks in the wall. They instantly began to disperse to the sides, opening the passage. Welcome to Diagon Alley, the professor said without unnecessary emotions, and led me forward. Diagon Alley was really diagonal. Numerous old English-style houses and shops looked oblique. People in all sorts of clothes walked everywhere. Sometimes, there were really unique characters that looked more like regular clients of the local mental hospital. Every now and then, owls flew overhead with letters or parcels in their paws, teenagers in robes scurried about. The adults were actively bargaining at the counters. In general, the place is impressive, contrasting when compared with the ordinary world. The professor and I first went to Gringotts, a local bank. On the way, she briefly explained to me the local currency system. It was a majestic three-story building. Inside, it looked more gloomy and darker. Throughout the hall, high racks stretched in two rows, behind which small goblins in tailcoats were engaged in important matters imitating work. We went to one of these racks, and I turned to the goblin. Good day, sir. I would like to exchange pounds for galleons. Will you provide a similar service? Of course, the goblin replied hoarsely, and I handed him a packet of pounds. The goblin quickly counted them and began pulling out stacks of gold galleons. For one galleon, he sold me a simple coin purse with an invisible extension. In the end, I got ninety-six galleons and some change at my disposal. Further purchases were completely uninteresting. We bought a school chest. I took a simple backpack with an invisible extension, into which I later put books for the first year, scales, a telescope, and so on. Potion-making ingredients were bought in a kit and shipped to Hogwarts on their own. Delivery The chest, by the way, was reduced by the professor and handed to me with instructions to lay it out on the floor at home, the spell will last exactly four hours. The purchase of robes and dragon gloves went through a routine. In Madame Malkin's store, two more guys were buying robes, but they were older. I was put on a stool, measured with enchanted instruments. About the desired fabric, I said that it would be nice if the material is non-marking, wear-resistant, and does not look like a bag of potatoes. Madame Malkin nodded and muttered something about the middle price range. Twenty minutes later, I became the owner of a set of three everyday robes, a winter raincoat, dragon hide gloves, and other little things. Also, I had to take a school uniform in dark gray. We went to buy a wand, of course, to Ollivander's shop, whose family, according to the peeling gilded inscription above the entrance, began doing this even before our era. Once in a slightly dusty, poorly lit room, I began to examine the shelves behind the counter, on which lay many small boxes. Hello! Ollivander said suddenly. He emerged like a devil from a snuffbox from some dark corner. Oh, Mr. Knight. Max Knight, I interrupted him, for he definitely recognized me. Yeah, let's write it down, he played along, coming closer. As far as I understand, you came here for your first magic wand? Undoubtedly. Great, the wonderful gray-haired old man threw up his hands. Which hand do you prefer to use? Right, sir. After my words, different meters and rulers flew up to me through the air. They measured everything along and across and even the circumference of the head. After that, the master brought out a dozen boxes and began to suggest that I try to take one wand after another. The eighth came up. Dark in color. As soon as I took it in my hands, a bright bundle of multicolored sparks fell from the tip of the magic wand. Perfectly. Amazing. Ollivander took my wand and started packing it back into the box, and even put the sheath inside for it. 
flexible, biting, 12 and a half inches. Acacia and Dragon Heartstring Loyal and powerful, very powerful, and most importantly suitable for any magic, but prefers something new and extraordinary, like its owner's thinking. I am sure you have a great future, Mr. Knight. Certainly, sir, I nodded gratefully to Ollivander, paying according to the price list. At this, our purchases ended, and the professor operat with me to the doorstep. She handed over a train ticket, said goodbye, and disappeared in one direction she was guided by. It turned out somehow chaotic. Upon my return, the knights were waiting for me, whom during all this time I could not fully perceive as a father and mother. Yes, they are excellent relatives, and I perfectly understand that a family is not a list of who gave birth to whom. However, the understanding that I was not born into this family does not allow them to be treated entirely as relatives. Even though for them, as they say, I will tear. They did not pressure me with overprotection, but they were not categorical in their decisions either. They always took into account my interests, but they did not hesitate to give advice and strong recommendations. I got a lot of new things, at least take the same etiquette. This does not mean that I was an uncouth pig in a past life. No, but I did not have an understanding and knowledge of specific various rules. And now even the posture is good. Here, however, sensei should also be given credit. In general, I recall the canon Hermione. Could I just take and erase from the life of these people all those years that they devoted to me? Eliminate their joys at my success and disappointments at rare failures? Cross out pride in education, warmth and tenderness, the joy of the first step of such a small and charming me? No. Definitely not. For the sake of your peace of mind, that relatives are safe? Never. Find a way to keep them safe, but not erase the memory. Well, something I digress. For almost a month, I have now worked hard on the magic books. The impressions are ambiguous. On the one hand, it is new and exciting. Still, on the other hand, the presentation of the material is merely awful. I have never seen such a concentration of material about nothing. Abstract thoughts and arguments, no material base, justification. Unless potion making still somehow resembled something scientific. Then, only due to the table of compatibility of ingredients with numerical coefficients, otherwise a recipe book. Perhaps the older courses books will be closer to the educational literature, but for now, just nothing. Maybe I should pay attention to some scientific works in the Hogwarts library? However, the general trend in the first-year textbooks is alarming. I didn't practice with the wand because there's something like watching the magic of Muggleborns. The statute of secrecy, etc. Therefore, I just analyzed the movements with a regular stick. I didn't memorize it, I just took it apart, and at the same time, did various exercises for flexibility of the hand. I developed them very well due to the violin and piano. Well, I think so. On Potter's birthday, I went to Diagon Alley in the morning. First by bus to Charing Cross, then to the Leaky Cauldron on their own. I didn't put on my robe, so I went in a suit and a black shirt. The bartender didn't even ask me where I was going and why. Having touched the necessary bricks with a stick, I got to the street I needed. At this time, there were a lot of people here, more than on my first visit. I walked to Café Fortescue, a pleasant milky-colored establishment. I sat down at the far table, so that I could see the whole street through the large windows and ordered tea. Earlier I thought, out of my stupidity, that there was nothing to order except ice cream. I was wrong, I admit. A full-fledged café, although it is known precisely for the ice cream, high quality, tasty, and varied. I waited for Hagrid and Potter. What for? It is on this day that I know for sure that I can meet Narcissa. Not the smartest move, but I damn want to see her. When Hagrid appeared in Diagon Alley, Harry, Shaggy, in a brown coat, towering dangerously above the crowd of ordinary people, I paid for the tea and moved to Ollivander's shop. If I remember the essence of Malfoy and Potter's conversation in Madame Malkin's shop correctly, Narcissa went to choose his wand. Stupid, as for me, because without Draco himself, this trick is almost impossible. 
unless they already know what approximate parameters, wood, and core the stick should have. Maneuvering through the crowd of people, I finally got to the place I needed and, opening the door of Ollivander's shop, stepped inside. Nothing has changed since my last visit. The same dim light from the lamps under the ceiling picked up from the gloomy darkness, the same light dustiness, the same counter, and the shelves rose behind it. At the counter stood a rather tall, stately slender woman with a simple, but pleasant-looking hairstyle of very light hair, like mine. She stood with her back to me and talked about something with Ollivander. The master noticed me and smiled affably, nodded invitingly. Good day, master I nodded and went to the counter. Oh, good day. What are you for, Mr. Knight? On my last name, he somehow sarcastically grinned. Of course. It may be that his hazy gaze of pale blue eyes can mislead someone. Still, the old man was definitely not blind, both literally and figuratively. I would like to ask you what you recommend for the care of my wand specifically. Forgive me, but I don't believe in universal remedies. And you are doing the right thing, young man. Ollivander shook his forefinger instructively. Now, I'll find something specifically for your wand. Mrs. Malfoy? It's okay, I heard a familiar voice full of detachment. I still have something to decide on. It was only now that I noticed there were open boxes of wands on the counter in front of her. Ollivander went away, and I began to shamelessly consider Narcissa. She has grown old. Too much. Wrinkles near the eyes and on the forehead, pits appeared near the mouth, small folds. The skin is not the same. And the look is kind of empty, extinguished, or something. Well, a sorceress in the world of magic cannot look like that in her. And how much? Thirty-five? Thirty-six? Around this range. It's incredible how quickly time flies, isn't it? I said neutrally, drawing the woman's attention to myself. You're right. As soon as Narcissa looked at me, almost hidden surprise and misunderstanding appeared in her eyes. Not every time you look at a stranger and see in his face almost your reflection, except that he is much younger. Knight. Last name of my adopted parents. Mr. Knight. Narcissa returned the mask of detachment to her face. A dramatic pause was brewing. It seems that only yesterday you become a happy parent, and now it's time to collect your child to Hogwarts. Amazing. Excuse me, do we know each other? It's strange. Does she even have no suspicions about our similarities? I would even say an absurd resemblance. Well, she couldn't forget. Although. I looked at her, trying to give my face a slight concern. What do you think, Mrs. Malfoy? What in the wizarding world can make a happy mother forget about the very existence of her child? Perhaps it is worth turning to an independent legilimate? And no, oddly enough, but we do not know each other. What a magical world. Full of miracles. I wonder what would have happened to me if my hypothetical wife had a legilimate friend and potions master. Curious, isn't it? This phrase finally put Narcissa into a state of incomprehension. But she answered. That would be a pretty reasonable thing to do. And the situation from the outside. Really intriguing. The doorbell rang behind me, and I turned to look at the new visitors an average height man in a black suit and robe. Straight, almost white hair fell just below the shoulders, an arrogant face, a contemptuous gaze, lazy mannerisms. A rare accessory in these places caught the eye a black cane with a silver snake-shaped top. Next to him stood a small, stunted boy with the same, practically white hair slicked back. He tried to copy the elder's demeanor, but it turned out frankly funny, so I could not help but smile. My brother is a weakling. My father is a prude. My mother has grown old prematurely, having lost that irrepressible live shine of blue eyes. It's kinda sad. Lucius clearly recognized me, and the slight contempt gave way to bewilderment and recognition. So he immediately guessed, and Narcissa? Oh, what a disgusting world. And I brought a remedy, here, sudden Ollivander diffused the situation. I don't even know what allowed me not to twitch, when he appeared, literally a step away from me. To care for your wand. Oh, master. 
Thank you very much. How much do I owe you? I took in my hands a small, simple wooden box, with the initials, G.O. A trifle, the master, dismissed with a smile. Twelve sickles. I quickly took out one galleon and handed it to the master. Ollivander immediately fished out five sickles from somewhere for a change. I looked again at the faces of those present. Narcissa was thoughtful, but it was hard to see it a mask of indifference and almost the same extinct look. Nearly. Lucius was in an even more surprising state. The petty Draco looked from everyone in the hall, trying to find a clue for further action. If I were you, I would have looked more closely at my feet, Mr. Malfoy, I said with a slight grin. Otherwise, you risk trampling your own lost face. Fortunately, you are not in my place. Lucius quickly regained his composure. Do you even know who you are talking to? Small Draco flared up, whose face slightly went red spots. However, his outburst of emotion was abruptly crushed by Lucius's cane's handle that suddenly fell on his shoulder. Son. Sorry, father, the guy obeyed, taking a step back. I just grinned and headed for the exit from the shop. Have a good day, I nodded goodbye to everyone, and with a clear conscience, but with a heavy burden on my soul, I went home. I do not want to build my assumptions about everything around me, and I will not. It's just that all this is somehow sad. I looked around the thickets of the park and did not find anyone around. Overcoming my doubts, I summoned the sword. A thin stream of blood enveloped the hand, flowing down extremely quickly and forming the shape of a blade. As soon as it formed, the sword finally appeared in my hand. A series of experiments had already been planned, and everything was prepared, so I proceeded to the first task. Twisted the sword in his hands. Lightweight, almost weightless, but by some instinct, I understood that his weight is quite consistent with the size. I swung and hit a thick piece of wood, like a knife, through butter. There are now two bars. I took the second block in my hand and already lowered it onto the sword's blade. The block was now cutting a little harder, like cheese. The resistance of the material was already felt. The next in line was the rod from the armature. The adoptive father has been keeping them for six years since the wall strengthening between the house and the garage. I stuck a small rod into the ground, swung, and cut it off almost as easily. Then I took the stump and repeated the bar's maneuver, lowered it onto the blade. The steel bar was cut even tighter, but still absurdly easy. At this point, I wanted to remove the sword, and it, obeying my will, again spread blood over my hand, immediately disappearing. I conducted similar experiments for two weeks and learned one thing. This sword is part of me. I came to this conclusion, quite by accident and unexpectedly. There were no prerequisites. Just once, for the sake of the experiment, I completely stuck it into the asphalt and asked the question, what are you? As such, I did not receive an answer, but I realized that this is an inseparable part of me, my soul, body, whatever. A kind of manifestation of my essence into the real world through hemomancy and other magical manipulations that I do not understand. As I understand it, the sword, hemomancy, and soul, cannot be considered separately. It's all strange. I didn't experiment with it anymore, I just didn't know what tests to set up. In mid-August, I had an interesting conversation with the Knights. In connection with the letter, new books, which I also bought on Diagon Alley in the junk shop, with all these events I forgot a little about an important thing, ordinary education. I do not want to plunge headlong into the magical world and only make plans in it. It was about this, or rather, about ordinary education, that the knights remembered. You always need a backup plan. And a backup plan to a backup plan. Etc. I understand. John and I talked in the dining room over tea and delicious cinnamon rolls. And what do you think, Max? John asked, putting his cup aside. It would be nice to somehow continue studying. And after Hogwarts, if everything is bad in the wizarding world, it will be possible to go to some university or college if I go out like a fool. Ha! Huh. Fool! Of course. John chuckled. But I'm glad that you still remembered this. I took the liberty of transferring you completely to external studies. 
not a problem. I snapped the knuckles on my left hand, a strange habit that came back from a past life. That is great. Your textbook on mathematical analysis is covered in dust. However, before, you used to solve a task every day or two. I really thought that you completely lost your head with this magic. On that and decided. I was ordered to purchase a means of communication and L. The trip after an L turned out to be chaotic, fast because we had decided it closer to evening and wanted to finish all the preparations already today. Everything was done in a hurry. I went to the leaky cauldron alone, although John gave me a lift. I'm very interested, but I don't want to see with my own eyes. I do not want to regret in my old age that I do not own magic. The choice and purchase were also pretty simple. I looked around a large number of cages with various owls and eagle owls. The birds didn't care about everything, but one unpretentious owl, whose species I do not understand at all. She drew attention to me and took it along with the cage and a large package of owl cookies. This is a treat. And on an ongoing basis, they eat everything. At first, the owl was not eager to obey the knights, but it always clung to me and strove to grab my finger. I had to talk to her about her professional suitability, and the owl, it seems, began to behave normally with the knights. Good. On the morning of September 1st, we collected everything we needed, all sorts of underwear, socks, toothbrushes, towels, and other things we needed but not indicated in the list. I immediately put on my school uniform, and John and I, putting my stuff from the chest into the trunk, went to the station. The owl will live at home. Basically, the knights will have to write to send me assignments from a regular school. They decided to initiate everyday correspondence. The knights figured that I could forget to write letters home, immersed in the study of the new and incredible. At King's Cross Station, we packed our belongings into the cart, said goodbye, and I drove to the transition to platform nine and three quarters. For some reason that I don't understand, Professor McGonagall did not tell me how to get there. Well, from the tale of Harry Potter, I know that you need to go through the wall, between the ninth and tenth platforms. Having rolled the cart to the supposed transition point, I poked my finger against the wall, there was no obstacle. In general, a strange sensation that causes cognitive dissonance, you see an obstacle, but you cannot find it. Every now and then, ordinary people scurried around, but as if something was taking their eyes away from this place. Without any overclocking, I passed through this strange barrier, and the world around me began to play with different colors. It really is. From the side of the ordinary world, the station is extremely gray and gloomy. Well, the station does not mean a wealth of colors. Everything is bright here, even the red bricks of the wall. If ordinary people dressed conservatively, gloomily, because they were in a hurry on business, work, etc., then the style is free. The colors are at the discretion of the magician. Diversity. There were ordinary, familiar clothes, there were combinations of them, there were long dresses to the floor, robes. And there were Weasleys. If we consider the boho style as the concept of what you find, then put on, then this red-haired family is an ardent admirer of this style. I did not focus my attention on them and quickly rolled the cart to one of the scarlet carriages. I always liked steam locomotives in some way, and now I tried not to look in his direction. In order not to accidentally pester someone with questions. I also tried not to pay attention to the students and their parents. A curly-haired girl stood at the carriage entrance I needed, and lifting the trunk clearly caused her difficulties. Why isn't there a freight car? It would be logical. But wizards can shrink things, levitate them, put them in different bags with invisible expansion. They seem to lack the very concept of freight transport as unnecessary. Can I help you? I asked the girl, stopping my cart next to her. She almost jumped, turning abruptly, looking at me in surprise. I bet it's Hermione. It looks like that actress, but there are some subtle differences. It's hard to say, I don't remember very well, what was her name there? Oh, it doesn't matter. Yes, that would be great, she nodded, returning her face, to a little more importance. You might even think that she is doing me a favor. Nicely. 
then wait for a second, I unloaded my trunk from the cart, threw the strap of my backpack over my shoulder, and put the cart next to several more empty ones. I took the girl's trunk by the handles and cheerfully dragged it into the carriage, went out, and did the same with mine. The girl followed. The good news is that the chests can be rolled with one side on the surface, at least they thought of that. Thank you very much, the girl nodded as we walked down the corridor in search of an empty compartment. No problem, the compartment was found almost at the end of the car. We settled quickly, shoving the chests under the seats, and sat down opposite each other. I'm Hermione Granger, the girl introduced herself. Maximilian Knight. Just Max. Very nice. Mutually. Hermione looked out the window. After a couple of seconds of silence, and she spoke. Quite quickly and a little delighted. It's just incredible, the girl turned to me. Max, did you know that you are a wizard? I didn't and was terribly surprised when I received a letter from Hogwarts. That is pleasantly surprised, of course. My parents are completely ordinary people, and the fact that I am a witch is simply incredible. She took a breath. Looks expectantly. Is this an interview? A funny girl. I wonder how I would react if I were younger in mind. Well, my parents are wizards, but I grew up in a family of ordinary people for reasons beyond my control. In theory, I should not have the ability to magic, but now, I'm going to Hogwarts. And I would not like to talk about it. Okay. You know, I learned all the textbooks in the first year. Do you think this is enough to be the best at school? I do not know. I think practice is very important. But even without knowledge, it will be incomplete. But knowledge without practice is just words from books. It seems to me that success cannot be all about one thing. Perhaps? Hermione thought about it, and the train had already started. We pulled out the books and decided to read while smiling at each other. Well, that Hermione would choose to read, I had no doubt. After half an hour, the girl decided to continue the conversation. She closed the book, holding her finger on the desired page. Max, what house do you think you will go to? I really hope I get to Gryffindor. This is the best house. Dumbledore himself studied there. And Merlin himself studied in Slytherin, I chuckled. Hermione was about to open her mouth to be indignant, but suddenly changed her mind. I'll tell you a secret, continued the conversation. An ancient artifact will distribute us. It might offer a choice if you fit multiple houses, but that's just a guess. What are you going to Hogwarts for? Study, of course. Which house is best suited for learning? Ravenclaw. I also considered it as an option. There is even a small library in the living room. However, I do not know what exactly is stored there. At the word library, Hermione's eyes literally lit up with curiosity. If she had the opportunity, she would already be there. She's funny. They say that Gryffindor is too noisy and hectic, I continued my thoughts. At the Hufflepuff, hard work is welcomed. There is a friendly team that never climbs anywhere and does not stand out. Therefore, they are considered worthless dullards for nothing. Stupidity, as for me. And Slytherin? Everywhere it is written that this is the house of dark magicians, and even you know who studied there. Voldemort, or what? Well, yes, he studied. And Merlin studied there. You know, I live in a fairly quiet and decent suburb, but I'm not blind, and more than once saw dark-skinned people pushing drugs, participating in gangs, robbing. There are probably even killers among them even though these are moments of a past life, but here everything is so the same. But what does this mean? Hermione didn't answer, and I immediately continued. Are all black people bad? Without exception? But what about, well, let's say, Charlie Parker? Art Tatum? The most luxurious jazz musicians of the early and mid-twentieth century. Bad too. But the books say. People write books. People can be wrong. People can be brainwashed. People can be taken under control, memory can be erased, or false memories can be implanted. Skillful propaganda of the ideas of nationalism led to the prosperity of Nazism and the Second World War. 
Do you think that Italians and Germans throughout history did nothing but cultivate these ideas? They cared for and cherished, but there was no leader, and then bam. And away we go. Or what? Of course not. However, the books are approved by the Ministry of Magic, and there can be no lies in them. One brainwashed man wrote a book, another published the same book, the third passed through censorship, the fourth certified. Why not? And then there are bribes, blackmail, whatever. Well, this is too much. Hermione was offended either by my words or by the idea. Why not? Have you heard this expression, history is written by the winners? The girl nodded and continued the quote. Therefore, it does not mention the losers. Arthur Drexler. Exactly. This is an entirely viable concept, because who will refute the words written by this very winner? If it is unprofitable for people to know something, this will not be mentioned in modern publications. But in the old ones it can be the same, but vice versa. I prefer to collect information, ponder, compare with observations, and only then draw conclusions. Although I myself sometimes sin with blind faith in what is written. So I talked with Hermione about all sorts of little things. It turned out that she has a phenomenal memory for text and pictures, and, I think, this is where her problem lies. When I asked for the sake of interest a couple of transfiguration theories from the book, she immediately quoted them to me, and even more, she recited a couple of paragraphs by heart. But when I asked to summarize the thoughts from the text and draw conclusions in a nutshell, it caused severe difficulties for Hermione. She even almost flared up, saying, Why is it incomprehensible? People with absolute memory may well have these problems, and they go away with age and experience. Since they do not have to strain their brains to extract information, to simplify it for better memorization and assimilation, they are poorly able to work with the memorized material. Immediately I remembered, and completely, I used it, threw it aside. The same problem is with those who regularly use a computer in their work, they look for any information on the internet, use it on the spot, and that's it. You don't need to learn, remember, simplify, analyze, and the brain works along the path of least resistance, there is no need to do it, so I will not waste energy on it. We were almost the only ones who stood at the carriage exit even before the train began to stop. Therefore, they avoided the crush, although the students began to crowd into the corridors rather quickly. The train stopped, the doors opened, and we all gathered in a united crowd onto the dimly lit platform of Hogsmeade. The older students went to their side, shouting a couple of times to the first years, to wait for their escort. We waited. The Hogsmeade platform itself was small. A platform, a couple of old English stone houses, a few lamp posts. The village itself began a little further. Its lights were clearly visible in the thickening darkness of an autumn evening. First years. All to me. The low bass rang out, and we all had the dubious honor of seeing Hagrid. Still the same shaggy bearded and all in the same brown shabby cloak, I saw him back on Diagon Alley. Oh. Hi Harry. How are you? Contrary to my thoughts, no one paid attention to Harry. If he had said, Hi Potter, then yes, they would have. Who is this? Hermione asked, looking dumbfounded at the half-giant. This is Hagrid. Works as a groundskeeper at Hogwarts. How do you know? The girl turned sharply to me. Watching, listening, thinking. Hagrid took us down a dark path somewhere down and, after a while, brought us to the pier, by the lake. We sat four people in the boat and set off on a short voyage, to Hogwarts. By the way, we saw the castle on the shore, but it did not make a special impression on me for some reason. Big, beautiful, the moon that came out in time from behind the clouds added beauty to this view. Heh, I am a child of urbanization and megalopolises. Here is a picture from the fifth element when you look down in a flying car. There are many thousands of such machines scurrying along multi-level air corridors. The foundations of super skyscrapers are lost somewhere below, yes. It's powerful. And this is just the castle. After the ride across the lake, disembarkation naturally followed, but already on a stone pier almost at the base of an almost sheer cliff, on the top of which Hogwarts stands. 
Hagrid led us up the stairs until we were in the courtyard of the castle, right in front of the door at which the half-giant knocked loudly. McGonagall opened the door, and the half-giant turned us over to her. We walked along the dark corridors of the castle. Our footsteps on the stone-laid floor echoed with a booming noise along the spacious and high corridors, the light of torches that sometimes could not disperse the darkness under the ceiling. The professor took us to a small room, in which, after our arrival, there was not much room left. McGonagall read out a pre-prepared speech that we have to go through the distribution ceremony. We will get into one of the four houses, live together, become a family, peace, friendship, gum, points. She left, leaving us alone with our worries, but promised to return. Immediately there was a noise from many voices. Many decided to immediately discuss their thoughts with the first person who came to hand and share their impressions. But soon, even more impressions were added because suddenly ghosts floated out of the walls. I was ready for this. Indeed, this was the only thing that didn't allow me to throw something of blood out of surprise at them. Although it would not have helped. But I felt a response from the sword. He definitely has his own mind, even if he basically wanted to spit on what was happening. McGonagall returned and, having dispersed the ghosts, led us back. Passing large double doors in what is perhaps the largest corridor, she stopped opposite them and pushed weightlessly with one hand, easily opening them. The hubbub of many voices fell on us, which almost immediately died down as soon as the professor took us into the hall. The Great Hall of Hogwarts was truly impressive. Well, not the hall itself, but an enchanted ceiling and many flying candles above the tables. At the four tables that stood along the hall, students of different ages were sitting, and at the last, fifth, which stood across at the very end, were the teachers, led by Dumbledore himself. This ceiling is so enchanted by the founders themselves. I read about it in the history of Hogwarts. Hermione is so Hermione. The professor took us to the teacher's table, brought a stool with an old shabby brown hat, and stepped aside. The hat began to move, its folds folded into a semblance of a face, and she began to sing. My ears almost blew from it. Singing off key. After a colossal hat fiasco in the vocal area, McGonagall began calling in the incoming children on the list. It was necessary to go out, sit on a stool, and endure a couple of moments, finding a dusty artifact on my head. The students came out one by one, so here Hermione came out. She was clearly talking about something with the hat, long and hard. Gryffindor McGonagall took off the hat from her and Hermione went to her new table. Thoughtful, seemingly joyful, but apparently not. I did not particularly look for the rest, only noticing some interesting children about whom I do not know anything at all. Take Greengrass, for example. A doll girl, absurdly perfect in appearance and with great boredom on her face. About her, in the story of Potter, we know only that she exists, and this is already a lot given the number of children and teenagers around, which I have not even heard, read, or seen. Night, Maximilian. Hearing my name, I walked over to the stool, turned around, and sat down. McGonagall immediately dropped the hat on my head. Hmm. Curious. And where should I send you? Definitely not Slytherin, I said inwardly, turning to the hat. Why not? In Slytherin, you can achieve greatness too many problems. Do not like difficulties? Everything should be in moderation. Well, you do not attach due importance to friendship, as well as you do not possess due brightness and unusual personality, and therefore. Gryffindor, the hat screamed to the whole room, and McGonagall immediately took it off me. I went to an empty seat at the table to thunderous applause from the students of my new house. The students of my house were happy, congratulated, someone clapped on the shoulder. Too noisy, but I think I can handle it. I am happy that we got to the same house, Hermione, sitting next to me, addressed me. Me too, nodded in response, and we began to look at further distribution. Malfoy, of course, got on Slytherin, and instantly, the hat did not even touch his head. When Potter was summoned, everyone immediately fell silent, but every now and then, questions came from everywhere, Potter? The same Harry Potter? 
and the boy did not at all look like a celebrity in terms of his physical condition. A small, shy child, not accustomed to neatness, black hair sticking out in different directions a dashing and silly look. And, of course, bicycle glasses and a scar on his forehead, barely covered with a bang. And, of course, he was sent to our house. It was then that the students around literally exploded with delight in all its manifestations. It was even hard for me to sit still. When all the students were assigned, Dumbledore decided to keep his word. He congratulated everyone on their admission and said the very four words, the meaning of which has escaped the understanding of the fans of the universe for many years. Now they will torment me too, because I did not see much sense, but the slight tension that hovered around the hall was gone as if there was nothing. When Dumbledore sat back down in his throne-like chair, various dishes appeared on the tables in an instant, for all tastes. Fried, and boiled, and stew. Chops, sausages, baked chicken, pork ribs. Or maybe not pork. Baked boiled potatoes, salads, in general, here you could really find everything both for a hearty dinner and for a light snack. One of the many Weasleys, Ron, immediately began to eat as if he had come from a hungry land. Not so piggy, of course, but I was still glad I didn't sit too close to him. This is perhaps the only thing that annoyed me. And so, I sat quietly, ate, watched the people around. Someone shared stories related to their origins. A chubby, humble boy, who I thought was Neville, told the story of his first magical release. On that fine, joyful day for the whole family, Neville's uncle wanted to once again provoke a magical release from the boy. For this, he hung him upside down through the window, holding one of them. Uncle got distracted and released Neville. If he really was a squib, then this would be the last day of his, not the best life, but like a rubber ball, he jumped down the street. A nightmare, frankly. Basically, no one asked me about anything. The feast ended with all the food and plates disappearing and Dumbledore getting up from his chair to start another speech. He told about the forbidden corridor, the list of forbidden things, that the forbidden forest is forbidden. Then, with a slight movement of his magic wand, he created the illusion of words, the Hogwarts anthem, and everyone sang it, each in his own way. Although not all, some just opened their mouths. After this speech, the prefects of the houses took us to the drawing rooms. Our prefect, Percy Weasley, looked grave and proud and peering at everyone condescending. The living room path ran along corridors, stairs, along the most real square shaft of the central tower, where staircases sometimes changing their direction could lead you to almost any floor of the castle, including the dungeons. I would call this place a transport hub. It is this association that comes to mind. There was also an incredible number of living portraits and tapestries of all sizes. They were hung out with a kind of mosaic and, in many places, covered the walls with a continuous layer, despite the difference in size from each other. On the way, we met Peeves, a local poltergeist. We didn't manage to avoid the dubious pleasure and not get to know him. Neither Percy's threats to deal with him personally or to call the bloody baron had an effect. This ghostly bully almost beat someone with crutches. We need to find a couple of spells against this follower of chaos. Already in the living room itself, the exit to which was hiding the fat lady's portrait, Percy read us his speech about the house, how cool we are, what a fantastic house, how great Dumbledore, and in general. I happily ignored it. Then we were taken to the bedrooms, the boys to one wing, the girls, to the other. Ron, Harry, Neville, Dean Thomas, and Seamus Finnegan were brought into the room with me. We quickly dispersed to the beds, and, to be honest, I don't really like the idea of a shared life. Although this is not even a hostel, a barracks. There are little space, a personal bed, and a chest, that's all. Well, okay, I'll think of something over time. While getting ready for bed and changing clothes, we shared some impressions of Hogwarts. Before going to bed, I went to the shower room shared by the men's wing. I have developed the habit of taking a shower in the morning and evening. I will need to follow this schedule. When I returned to the room, everyone had already seen what is being said, the tenth dream. And I have to go sleep too. When there is something to do, time flies by a proverb. 
For the first few days, I settled into the castle, putting Hermione on my tail. The girl initially showed resistance, but gave up on the argument that it is necessary to know precisely the place where you plan to live for another seven years. Therefore, she fought with her desire to sit in the library. We walked around the castle, most of our free time. Drawing up an approximate plan in our head, without considering various secret corridors, and other things, we did not know them. Percy Weasley quite often left the first years on their own, rather than escorting them to the offices, as he should. Therefore, the guys were often late for the first classes, but we were not because we already knew where to go. Classes themselves were nothing special. McGonagall was strict and immediately proved herself to be the guardian of rules and discipline. She gave a lot of theory and magic formulas for memorizing and only then moved on to practice. For the almost complete transformation of a match into a needle in the first lesson, Hermione received points because, although imperfect, she is the first to achieve a result. After a couple of minutes, I performed a complete transformation, using willpower and detailing the visual transformation process, but I got half the score. The charms lesson with Professor Flittick was interesting. The professor himself, a short man in a black tailcoat and green robe, turned out to be quite cheerful and optimistic, often brightening up a boring theory with stories from life. It does not matter fictional or not. In the classroom, we learned different movements, their components, wrote down the magic theory, which never revealed its essence or work mechanism. But we recorded and taught. During potions making, Professor Snape was serious and formidable bombarded Potter with questions, did not talk about safety. Preparing ingredients and brewing a potion was more like preparing food, but there were some nuances. Suppose you carefully monitor the cauldron situation and the reaction to stirring. In that case, we can conclude that everything is individual for each wizard. If Hermione needs to stir it two times clockwise to bring the potion to a specific state, then for me a little less, a tenth turn. It is interesting. And yes, Neville blew up the cauldron, but there were no casualties, besides him. The professor sent the whimpering guy to the hospital wing and took points from Potter. Why? Because he could. I understand that. Fuck them and the intrigue around the guy, I need to learn. And I studied. Herbology is a magic garden, with all that it implies. In addition to gardening, this lesson can help you gain knowledge about specific properties of plants that are not described in books on potions in the section on compatibility and properties of ingredients. Astronomy is astronomy. Everything is in the title of the lesson. Celestial bodies and their movements in the sky are studied. The history of magic is the monotonous muttering of the ghost of Professor Beans. Everything he tells is literally written in the textbook and a constant topic of lectures is the goblin uprisings. A subject like defense against the dark arts was no less farce than history. Especially when you consider Quirrell a stutter, always stinking of garlic and a slight cadaveric smell that for some reason no one can smell. He, like Beans, decided that quoting the textbook was a great idea. Here I disagree, but what can I do? Even the first lesson of flying on brooms did not interest me. Mainly because we didn't have a chance to fly, Neville still fell off his broomstick. Malfoy provoked Potter, and the latter eventually became a seeker on the House Quidditch team. But this is a big secret that, perhaps, everyone knows about. Hermione and I don't get involved in anything at all. At first, the girl was shocked that no one wants to study. Everyone is just having fun and looking for adventure and trouble. I, if you dig a little deeper, by and large, do not care. Still, her irrepressible energy, aimed at bringing order to the house's chaos, causes an adverse reaction. So I decided to talk to her about this. We sat in the far corner of the library, finishing our transfiguration homework. Listen, Hermione. Yes, the girl put the last point in the parchment and set the writing materials aside, looked at me. Do you have to always correct and help everyone in everything when they don't ask? Of course. After all, if the guys are doing something wrong, you definitely need to tell and show how it should be, she nodded significantly. Don't you notice that nobody likes it? The girl frowned at me defiantly. What do you mean? Don't be offended, but you are considered an incredible nerd and boring. 
Really? And where does she get so much confidence in my words? Yeah. If somebody asked for help, then it's okay. Otherwise, you only put yourself in a bad light. But the house is losing points, and this is unacceptable. Hermione spoke softly but with such emotion as if she was about to scream. I, as always in such cases, involuntarily smiled. And why do we need these points, competitions, cups, and so on? It won't even be noted in the personal file, I found out. This is senseless competition and enmity of houses out of the blue. And do not be eager to answer that way at every lesson. Well, I mean, just raise your hand calmly if you want to. Half of the teachers don't ask you because they already understood that Granger knows everything. But they also need to work with other guys to see how they can formulate their thoughts. Can I have your essay? The girl began to think over my words and pushed the essay in my direction, and I plunged into reading this opus, which is at least three times more than mine. A bunch of quotes and just a couple of lines of her own conclusions. It's sad. I returned the parchment to Hermione. Hermione. Tell me why you again quoted everything from the textbooks and that couple of books we took the other day? But there is so much you can write. And it doesn't make sense at all. Teachers hardly want to see clippings from books because understanding the subject is much more critical. We've already talked about this. From that day on, we started studying thoroughly. Hermione struggled to formulate her own thoughts and conclusions on paper. I severely rejected her quotes. The girl sulked, puffed, but regularly overcame life's difficulties. Having thought about it, I came up with an exercise for her. Describe your thoughts about a paragraph of text without quoting or using terminology. Use only the information in front of her, only simple everyday words. But I, to some extent, got it from her. It turned into a kind of organizer that always reminded me of the most different tasks we face for the day. What cannot be taken away from her is her incredible ability to rationalize available time. At the same time, she is quite capable of taking into account the interests and needs of another person. But idleness is not for her. And not for me. Perhaps that is why there was no conflict of interest? Earlier, in my past life, I didn't think very well of Hermione. You can easily catch a hypertrophied mania in books and films to follow the rules to instill your vision of correctness and correct behavior in everyone. But no. Here she gladly enters into a reasoned argument. If the position of her opponent is supported by facts, Hermione considers it and may even agree. She loves and respects the rules, but she has her gradation of these rules in order of importance. Hermione will follow them until there is a real reason to break them but not for the sake of doing bullshit. In the books, she was very indignant and kept saying that she needed to study, do her homework, and prepare for lessons. As I found out, the reason for this was not that she was such a nerd, but the total idleness of her canon friends, Ron and Harry. It turned out that my memory is also perfect, and I just ignored it before. But it's okay. My day was not much different from weekdays outside Hogwarts. Exercise, shower, breakfast, homework, lunch, homework, dinner, a little homework, physical preparation, homework or sitting in the library, sleep. I even remember nothing special, in fact, the only difference from my usual daily routine, the mere fact that all of this at Hogwarts. In early October, we found a loophole in the rule about the prohibition of witchcraft in the corridors, you just need to do it in the classroom. The misunderstanding comes from the misinterpretation of the rules. It seems that magic can only be done in the classroom. And the prefect does not consider this issue. At the same time, it does not matter whether it is an active classroom or a long-abandoned one. In connection with this fact, we immediately found ourselves in one such class on the fourth floor and started to practice magic. This was the first real difference between our approaches and interests. I immediately rushed to mastering various spells with a combat bias, information on which we dug with great difficulty in the library's wilds. Reducto, bombarda, confringo, expulso. I just want to blow up and destroy. On the other hand, Hermione made a bias towards all sorts of magical interests, which most of all can be called miracles. 
It will create a blue fire that does not burn, then it will begin to transfigure something, while her eyes literally shone with happiness. Well, yes, you surprise anyone with explosions, but changing the shape and other properties of an object is, yes, it's powerful. Hermione wanted to try everything, check everything, and I memorized the same spells to automaticity. At the end of October, I decided to work on a new enchantment, conditionally harmless. A simple thought brought me to this, suddenly, a fight, an attack from around the corner in the corridors of the castle, and what should I do? Blow up, schoolchildren? Or set them on fire? What has been learned will undoubtedly help in a severe collision, but not in a school showdown. For this reason, I decided to diversify my arsenal. Expelliarmus, Evrutsdatum, Stupefy, Silencio. Several things have emerged regarding spells. It is entirely incomprehensible why a gesture and a verbal formula are needed. Spells cannot be obtained without them, but the question is different, how does it work at all? It is enough to know the gesture and the spell's verbal formula to produce the desired effect, which you may not even know about. In the transfiguration, you can also remember the general or specific formula for the case. How? Apart from this, I began to notice something else. The more often I use a spell, the easier it becomes. If you had to concentrate strongly on completing the task at hand in the first place, now you just have to wish. At the same time, if earlier an error in the execution of a gesture led to a breakdown of the spell, Exactly the same error does not affect in any way at the moment. Still, it allows you to perform a spell in a much more free gesture and posture. There is a guess that over time the motion will disappear as unnecessary, as well as the verbal formula. I shared these thoughts with Hermione during a break from my evening workout. Perhaps, in the course of training, we somehow record these spells in ourselves? Hermione gave out the theory when she got tired of training. And anyway, how can you jump around the classroom so much, without even sweating? In her voice, there was a distinct reproach and slight envy. I'll think about the recording. I jump because I have been doing various physical exercises from early childhood. I have been doing kendo for several years, and, in general, movement is life. PFFF, the girl smiled, turning away. What? It is much easier to dodge a spell and immediately attack than to take it first on Protego, which, by the way, we both fail. Boys. All you need to do is fight. Hermione, I sat down next to the girl at the desk. We now live in a magical world. Here, everyone from the age of eleven is armed and very dangerous. Hermione looked at me with incomprehension. Wand. Magic wand. It's not just a hammer for hammering in nails, a microscope for research, and a flashlight. This is a pistol, an automatic rifle, a grenade launcher, and in the hands of a potent wizard a nuclear missile. Judging by the somewhat shocked face, she did not consider the wand in this way, even seeing my practice of conditionally combat spells. People are people, I continued. And it doesn't matter. Ordinary people or wizards, people have always been good at inventing means of killing or subjugating their own kind. But this is wrong. Wrong, I nodded. But this is the nature of the majority of people. Did you know that the use of confundus is not only not prohibited, but also permitted? And the absolute legality of amortentia and other love potions? This is far from the entire list of spells and potions that allow, albeit for a short time, to subdue the mind. How many spells can cripple or kill? There is a myriad of them. Of course, you can slay with a pencil if you have the desire, but the fact that there are in the public domain a thousand and one ways to finish off your neighbor should lead to some thoughts. But what about the law? The ministry must keep track of such things. DMLE, Oris. Hermione once again loses faith in humanity in a dialogue with me. It's a pity, but it's better this way. Well, yes, they are. What's next? They catch criminals, but to become a criminal, you have to commit a crime. Do you understand? No? Well, someone will kill you, and then what? Perhaps he will be caught, punished, very mild, but you will already be dead. What good is his punishment to you? But, is it possible that even murder is punished here gently? 
A guaranteed trip to Azkaban is given only for the use of unforgivable spells and rituals with human sacrifice. Everything else according to the situation and depending on who is the victim and who is the accused. What do you mean? Hermione, Magical England is a tiny closed society. Magic families, surnames lived here for many hundreds of years, built relationships with each other, and so on. New surnames appear, make their way upward, acquire a particular reputation over many generations. To some extent, there is a caste system here, but not the same as in India. There you cannot go from class to class. Here you can. Everyone knows each other, everyone is familiar, everyone owes each other several times, and many pure blood relatives in general to one degree or another, even new pure blood surnames and a pure blood child have only wizards in his pedigree for at least three generations. In the ministry, the situation is no better. Everyone is looking for benefits, promoting their acquaintances, relatives, or promising wizards in terms of connections. Now, who are we? You are a muggle-born. For the local society a stranger, a new person who has no ties, no money, no one behind. I am documented as muggle-born, but in fact, I am pure blood. But only if this moment comes up, and it comes up, family, who by mistake disowned me, will somehow make amends for this issue. But how? The easiest way is to kill, because I am the living personification of the head of the family's error. I'll be a weakling, kill this disgrace. I'll be strong, kill this reminder of error and failure. If you or I am killed by a pure blood wizard, he will most likely get off with a large fine. If we slay such a wizard, we will go to Azkaban. You say such horrors. I don't even believe. Hermione lowered her head dejectedly. That's why I study offensive spells. I want to be able to protect myself. To become a potent wizard so that they would even be afraid to look at me crookedly. While we study at Hogwarts, we are under the patronage of Dumbledore. He is, of course, a politician, and I don't believe him a dime, but there is also a plus, no one will openly go against him. No one will openly attack us either, because this will untie the director's hands. Whatever one may say, he is the most potent wizard on the islands, and possibly in Europe. They may well build intrigues against him, but we are safe, too small bird from this side. Therefore, I want to take advantage of these seven years to the fullest to leave Hogwarts not as a fool, but as a wizard whose opinion will be reckoned with. And I recommend it to you. The magical world is a beautiful fairy tale, but according to the plots of the Brothers Grimm. After this conversation, Hermione, albeit somewhat reluctantly, added physical exercise to her schedule and began to work off attack spells. Before that, she thoroughly went through the library on the part of the legislation and was able to be convinced of my words, but I was not sure of them it was just a theory based on the knowledge of the canon. Good to know. October 31st, Halloween. The morning of that day began with the smell of pumpkin. After completing my standard morning warm-up routine and taking a shower, I went down to the Great Hall for breakfast. And then there was a pumpkin. It's not a holiday yet, but a pumpkin is already everywhere. I can't say that I don't love her, no. I am as indifferent to her as to oatmeal. But was it possible to organize a regular breakfast too? In the charm class, Professor Flittick finally decided that we had sufficiently learned the different basic movements with the wand and that we could finally get down to the practical part. And remember, he said from his pulpit, standing on an impromptu stand from Lockhart's books, it is very important to pronounce the words correctly. Let's repeat this wonderful gesture. Easy, sharp, and whistling. The professor demonstrated the gesture for Wingardium Leviosa, and we all repeated it several times. Perfectly. He said with a smile. Now, let's get down to practice. Does everyone have feathers on their tables? Yes. A discordant chorus of voices rang out. Then let's get started. Correct and not very verbal formulas began to be heard from all sides. The guys tried to do the gestures as best they could, and some just sat and looked at this theater of absurdity. As if from a firecracker, the sharp sound of a light explosion forced me to look towards its source. Next to Harry sat Seamus Finnegan, with a smoky face, and only the ashes of the feather remained on his desk. 
In the meantime, Ron was getting more and more enthusiastic, the ways of his wand became wider and wider, and his voice became louder. Now he is like a windmill waving his hand and, with a frenzied face, looks at the feather as an enemy of the people. Another movement and he almost knocked out Potter's eye. It's good that the boy is wearing armor. Hey Ron, take it easy. Sorry, buddy, the redhead calmed down. I looked at Hermione and waited for her to speak out about this, but she just shook her head dejectedly, rolled up her sleeves, and concentrated. A moment's concentration and the girl began to wave her wand, saying, Wingardium Leviosa. The pen immediately began to lift off the table, flying upward, obeying the movement of Hermione's wand. Oh. Miss Granger. A beautifully executed charms. Ten points to Gryffindor, Joyful Flittick actively applauded. At the end of the lesson, Ron even said something impartial about the girl, but now not that she is a nerd, but that she knows and does not help. Hermione was offended and wanted to run away, but I walked alongside her and grabbed her hand. Do not pay attention. There will always be such dissatisfied people. He will never admit that it is his fault that he lacks the necessary skills. It's easier to blame others. Of course, came a youthful voice, from the side, lazily drawing out the words. It's the Weasley, after all. Draco Malfoy personally honored us with a line. True, he was in no hurry to continue the dialogue and immediately left our society in the company of Crabbe and Goyle. Malfoy, surprisingly, in this one word, I managed to lay out my whole attitude towards him and Lucius. Hermione looked at me with interest, but didn't ask me anything. The whole day went on as usual. I sat next to Hermione at the gala dinner and was very little, but glad of the current situation she will not meet with the troll. Although this meeting could show. Yes, it would not show anything. Even in canon, Hermione did not understand that the world of magic is not a beautiful fairy tale. Hmm, maybe she understood because she became friends with the hero and his friend Ron. Oh, who would tell me what the characters in that tale were thinking? In the middle of the feast, the door suddenly opened, and a very amusing professor ran into the hall. Quirrell, out of breath, with his turban slightly knocked to one side, ran as if from fire, looked around, held the hem of his robe with one hand, and tried to straighten the turban with the other. Troll! He shouted. Troll in the dungeons. His words had a better effect than Silencio creating absolute silence at the tables of the houses. Quirrell almost ran to the teacher's desk, who were already getting up. Here at Quirrell, the battery has run out, and he stopped, with difficulty moving his legs. Didn't you know? He looked around with an unseeing glance. I was in a hurry to inform you. After that, Quirrell collapsed to the floor unconscious. Several seconds of deathly silence were blown up by the many-voiced screams and panic of the students. This did not last long. S-I-L-E-N-C-E. Dumbledore's voice resounded throughout the hall, abruptly interrupting the panic and commotion of the students. Prefects, take the students to the common rooms. The professors and I will deal with the problem. Of course, I think this indication is far from the most reasonable, but it does not matter. According to the bestiaries, it is relatively easy to deal with a troll. Even one fifth-year student will cope with the good luck, ingenuity, and timely detection of danger. Percy led us to the common room, and all the way, the students of all ages looked around nervously, now and then clutching wands in their hands. It is not surprising that the Death Eaters easily overwhelmed the magical community. Everyone here is afraid of their own shadow, let alone a terrible dark magician. In the common room, the feast continued, so to speak. As soon as the students were safe, the fun atmosphere immediately returned, and the people recoiled a little from the shock. Someone bragging that he could have done it easily, although a moment ago, he almost had to change his pants. Someone was just glad that everything turned out okay, while someone noticed that Harry and Ron were not in the common room. But as soon as all began to worry, McGonagall appeared in the aisle to the common room, almost dragging two downcast idiots by the ears. What the hell? It turned out that these two alternatively gifted ones flooded to look at the troll, and he almost killed them. Perfectly. I wonder what happens if I, purely hypothetically, 
kill Potter. How will Avada affect the Horcrux? It's incredible how a difference in one event can have a profound effect on further events. Hermione's absence from Harry and Ron's company was not doing very well for their academic performance. Nobody else joined them everyone had already broken up to their companies, except for Neville. But he was already fine because he regularly hung out in greenhouses with Madame Sprout and was engaged in plants. And many treated the boy well, although there was no direct friendship. Hmm, Neville's best friends are plants. I wonder what happens if I give him a cannabis sapling. Hermione and I systematically skipped Quidditch matches, receiving McGonagall's reprimands, but we knew how to bribe her. We just demonstrated our achievements in the field of transfiguration. We said that this was all thanks to hard work and training, but if we go to matches, when will we learn? McGonagall was moved by our desire for knowledge, and sometimes it seemed to me that a little more, and she would say something about me, but no. She didn't say anything. But she definitely recognized my absurd resemblance to Narcissa, and the rest of the professors are unlikely to suffer from blindness, but nothing good or bad happens to me. Like Draco, by the way, he does not show any negativity towards me, as well as positive I do not exist for him. He is completely immersed in a conflict with the hero and the sixth Weasley. In early December, I received a package from my relatives. We usually only correspond. I wrote about my successes. The Knights wrote about events in the outside world and even sent me regular newspapers. This time a package of tasks came from an ordinary school. What is it? Hermione asked at breakfast when she saw a bulky task bag dropped to me by an L. I was even afraid that he would knock me to death. Death would be absurd. Oh, this, Hermione, assignments from school. From school? The astonishment on her face defied verbal description. But why? That is, an ordinary school? Well, yes, I shrugged, putting the package in my backpack with an invisible extension. I use it instead of a school bag, convenient. It's not hard to carry things and the capacity is large. But, but. Why? Well, what you mean, why? I was feigned surprise. What if I can't work out with magic? After Hogwarts, I will calmly go to college or even university and build a normal life in the muggle world. If it doesn't work out here. This is genius. And how did I not think about it myself? Hermione quickly got up from the table and, throwing the strap of her bag over her shoulder, was about to leave the large hall. I urgently need to write a letter to my parents. Hermione left and Harry, sitting next to me, looked at me in surprise. What? There should always be a backup plan. Nothing, Potter hesitated. I just didn't even think that someone might want to return to the ordinary world because there is magic right here. Who said that I want? Potter and a few of the listening kids looked up in confusion. There is such a word, it is necessary. So that's it. As I said, in case of my total failure as a magician, I prepare myself escape routes. I don't seem to be a fool, so I think I can handle such a load. Why are you all so obsessed with this studying? Ron was indignant. Not to even go to Quidditch or play gobstones. Or chess, at worst. I don't have time for this. Life is too short to waste time. But where is the hurry? Ron was surprised. You are pure blood. You'll not understand. Hey! Our family treats Muggleborns quite well. Ron snapped. Now everyone at our table has listened to the conversation. I don't argue. It's just that pure bloods are at the helm of the wizarding world. Even despite the fact how your family is called in their circles, you have more prospects than muggle-borns, even if you will do nothing during the whole time of learning. You're wrong, Max, one of the guys from the senior year, spoke up. Both the legislation now encourages muggle-borns and the ministry. Console yourself with illusions, gentlemen. As if some pure blood in the tenth or twentieth generation will give way to you under the sun. Oh well. You can find out all the information on these issues, and I will go to study. With these words, I went to class. I still need to solve school assignments and send them back. 
for Christmas, Hermione, and I decided to stay. More precisely, I already knew that I would stay. Still, Hermione decided that it is possible to rest in the summer, which is perhaps not worth it. I insisted that Hermione write a large congratulatory letter to her parents and send gifts in the form of magic sweets. Sugarless. I did the same myself, and the Weasley twins were the sweet supplier, for a really modest sickle fee. I sent the school assignments with the school owl, and Hermione sent hers. According to her, her parents managed in record time to organize her external training and send tasks, and the stubborn girl solved them all in two days. Also, she finally got involved in physical exercise. Especially for this, I transfigured various sports equipment. Her parents also sent her a bunch of books on gymnastics and athletics. The only thing that disappointed me a little at Hogwarts was the inability to train with hemomancy and my spiritual weapons. I don't really believe there is even one place in this castle that can be hidden from the all-seeing eye of Dumbledore. Therefore, it is better not to shine such skills, just in case. Christmas itself passed unusually quietly in the empty castle. Hermione gave me a voluminous reference book on medical potions. And I remembered that I was interested in this topic. But I remember how Hermione watched as I performed the transfigured Shurnai Kendo Kata, so I asked my parents to get one book, Hagakure. I have this book, but somehow I don't want to shine it in front of the knights, they won't understand. Even I don't understand a lot, and the more I'm trying to understand it, the less I understand. Although a narrow-minded and straightforward person will consider Hagakure an unnecessarily cruel composition of a medieval samurai warrior. I reread it every year, and every year I see something new in it. And yes, the book is not related to Kata, but I'm wondering what happens if you give it to Hermione. The Christmas holidays were held under the motto, Take a Break from School, Study the Gift. It was quite funny to watch how Hermione sometimes wrote something out of the book, crossed it out, rewrote. It seems that she adjusted the ancient warrior's wisdom to the local reality, taking into account the magic. I thought, why am I only communicating with Hermione? After thinking about this question, I came to simple conclusions. I'm just comfortable with her. She is smart enough to understand my periodic statements. She, like me, came here to study. Constant house sloppiness and carelessness do not interest me, as well as her. As a result, neither she nor I have anyone to communicate with. Everything suits me. That is all for today. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this journey, make sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell. If you have any suggestions or feedback for me, please drop a comment down below.